Uh, hello and good evening. Okay, you can hear me. Right, so um, about a couple of months ago, I received an email from the lovely organizers here asking me to come and, and give a talk at uh, the TEDx conference. And I looked through the email, all very nicely worded, and at the end they said, TEDx Halkida, and the topic was ethos. I'm like, you guys know I'm an astronomer. Like, I look for, for planets around distant stars, right? What does that have to do with ethos? Ah, they said, you'll figure it out. So I did. Okay, so here's, here's the story. Okay, there's going to be a lot of science in it, but I promise no equations. Okay. So for some reason, I cannot see my notes, but I can improvise. Okay, lovely, thank you. Okay, so I'm an astronomer, and I've spent the last 20 years of my life uh, trying to find planets around other stars. We call them exoplanets for short. So why do we want to find uh, other planets? Uh, one obvious reason is that we want to find evidence of life elsewhere in the universe. So everything that we know about life is based on what we know about life on our own home planet, the Earth. Now, this is one sample. This is really bad statistics. Okay? All life on our planet is connected. We share a common origin. All life on Earth has DNA. Okay? If we find life elsewhere in the universe, it's not going to be like that. It's going to be a second origin, and that is massive. The biologists would love to know about it. Religions would love to know about it. Okay? So, it's interesting, to say the least. So, the discovery of life elsewhere in the universe will have profound scientific and philosophical implications. But there are also other reasons. We want to understand how planetary systems, including our own, form and evolve. What is their ultimate fates? And while we do this, we push our understanding of physics into extreme new realms, into new uncharted areas. We learn more about the world. So this is what I'm here to talk to you about, planets and how we find them. But I also want to talk to you about stories and their power to inspire. Stories are powerful things. We use them to teach things to our children and to each other. And they are not always true. That's fine. They don't have to be. What is important is that they get their message across. Okay? They need stories will plant seeds. Okay. They instill a desire to find things out for oneself and to explore new possibilities. Now, when I was a kid, there were plenty of science fiction stories going around. I mean, we had them on films, we had them on TV, we had them in books. And there was no shortage of them. Okay. We had, in the film Star Wars, you know, you, our heroes would go into the spaceship, they would jump into hyperspace, and poof, they were in a different system full of planets. It was taken as a given, as a given that there were planets everywhere in the universe. This is a lie. We didn't know about that. Okay, massive lie. It was a story. Okay, so I wanted to find out, really, if there are indeed planets out there, for a fact. Okay. Okay. So it was all just made up, it was just stories, and no one knew for sure whether there were other planets out there orbiting distant stars. So now we do. So in a, in a way, we are now able to, uh, to do some fact-checking, right, with the stories that we heard, or some of the things that they were promising to us. And what we have found is both exciting, but also unexpected. Now, as I said before, the topic is ethos. I'm not going to get to it right now. Let's focus on the science first, and I'll get to that at the end. Okay, so before we start talking about the discovery of other planets around distant stars, let's start by looking closer to home, okay? This is our own stellar neighborhood, okay? This is the solar system. There are eight planets in the solar system. If you're a little bit older like me, you learned about nine. Pluto is not a planet, it's a dwarf planet, but that's a different story. Okay, so there are eight planets orbiting our star, the sun. Generally, we've known about most of them since antiquity, uh, except the, these last two. Uh, the Greeks call them planetes, right, which is wanderers, is what it means, because they appear to move in the sky. They did not remain fixed in a single position. Stars remain fixed in a single position. So planets generally fall into two categories. 
We have small rocky ones with solid surfaces, like the Earth, Mars, and so on. And they're mostly made out of rock and metal. And then there are the gas giants, like Jupiter and Saturn. Sorry, the presentation is a little bit wonky. But anyway, so there are the gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn. And they're mostly made out of hydrogen and helium. And they lie, all the planets lie on a plane called the ecliptic. And they go around their business circling the sun. So let's zoom out a bit. Now, the sun lies on one of the spiral arms of our Milky Way galaxy, about here. So how far away is that? Well, the fastest thing in the universe is light that travels at 300,000 kilometers per second. And all kinds of weird things start to happen when you travel at the speed of light. So don't try this at home. So let's say we had a spaceship, OK? Let's, let's imagine we had a spaceship that could travel at the speed of light. So how long would it take us from here, starting from the Earth, to get to the center of the galaxy? We're traveling at the speed of light now. Okay? It would take us 28,000 years. That's how massive our galaxy is. Now, to travel the galaxy from one end until the other end, at the speed of light, it would take us 100,000 years. Okay, so it's a massive, massive place. The galaxy contains about 250 billion stars. So the sun is in good company. Nor is our galaxy alone. There are literally billions of other galaxies in the universe. Okay, little islands of light separated by vast stretches of darkness. Now, we haven't been able to find planets in any of those other galaxies, but we now know that almost every star in ours has at least one or more planets. So how do we find these planets? Okay, and here's where things get a little bit difficult. We've been trying to find planets around other stars for decades. It's not easy business, and here's why. Okay, the sun, it's a, like a massive nuclear reactor in the sky, okay? It's mostly made up of hydrogen, and then it takes the hydrogen out its center and it fuses it into helium, and then heavier elements at its core. So all those natural chemical elements in the periodic table that you learned about at school, okay, they are produced inside stars. Now, this nuclear fusion process produces extreme amounts of energy in the form of light, so the stars shine brightly. Planets don't have enough mass to ignite those nuclear reactions at their centers. Okay, so they don't produce their own light, they just reflect the light of the star that falls on them. So how much fainter is a planet compared to a star? Uh, I lied to you before when I showed you this drawing of the solar system that showed the sun about that big and the planets like that. The real size of the Earth, relative to the Earth, is this. That's a planet. That's a star. Small difference. Okay, so how much fainter are planets relative to the stars? Well, about a billion. That's not million, but a billion times fainter. So it's extremely difficult to see them. So most of the methods that we have developed to find them are indirect. Because it's like looking for a firefly next to a lighthouse from a few hundred kilometers away. So that's the kind of problem we're dealing with. So most of the methods that we have are indirect. So let's have a look at them. I'm mentioning only the four most important or successful ones. So the most successful at the moment is the transit method. This is uh, the method that the Kepler Space Telescope, perhaps some of you have heard about it, has used to find planets. It's really straightforward. You have the planet, and it passes in front of the star, blocks some of the light, and when you measure, the, you plot the light that you get from the star versus time, you get these little dips, okay? And every time the, the planet passes around the star, you get these little dips. You can also use those dips to find multiple planets around those stars. Um, now, there is a problem with that, okay? Because if the planet... The planet has to pass right in front of the star. If it's a little bit below or, or above, you don't see it. And you also need the planet to be relatively close to the star, okay, so that you get those dips often, so that you know it's a planet. 
So this method is particularly powerful in finding planets that are big and close to their stars. Okay? It's more sensitive to the type of planet we call in astronomy hot Jupiters. Another very successful method is called radial velocity. Sometimes it's called the Doppler method. And this looks for periodic changes in the star spectrum as the planet moves around it. Okay, so this is, you take the light from the star, you split it up in all the different colors of the rainbow, okay, and you look at the absorption lights of the different chemical elements that make up its atmosphere. Okay, and the lines move, or should move. Uh, I'm not sure why this animation isn't playing. Okay, all right, so the, uh, they move around. Okay, if the star doesn't have a planet, the lines just stay put like this. But if he has a planet, the planet kind of pulls the star back and forth. They orbit around the common center of mass. Okay, so when it's moving in front of it, its light is slightly blue shifted. When it's moving behind it, its light is slightly red shifted. This, this is why you see those wobbles. Now, a third method is microlensing. This one is perhaps the most difficult to describe, but stars, they're massive enough to bend the path of light that goes around them. Einstein taught us that about 50 years ago. Okay, so they act some kind of like a magnifying lens. And this is the brightness of the star going up when you have this front star passing in front of it. And if that star has a planet, it produces these little blips here. And that's how we know there's a planet. So um, the fourth and last successful me method is direct imaging. It just does what it says on the team, basically. It requires extremely large telescopes okay, with special adaptive optic systems on them to monitor the turbulence in the atmosphere. So you cannot find planets that are very close to the star. The star is far too bright. So what you see here is where the star should be. And they have a system that blocks the starlight, so you can actually see those, those planets far away. Now, what you're seeing here, this little video, took seven years to make. These are observations from the Keck Observatory in Hawaii, taken over seven years. And you can see part of the orbit. And I find this image fantastic. I think this is, this is amazing that we are able to do that. We can actually see planets around a distant, distant star. Okay, so these are the four methods that we have uh, available to us. Our toolkit, if you like. So how many planets have we found with them until today? Well, the current number I checked a few days ago is more than 4,000. And we have at least as many candidates we're finding more every, every day. So here's a video I made with the discovery timeline of all the planets. You start from the early 90s, we could find the biggest ones, uh, closest ones to, the, uh, to their stars, and now we're finding even smaller ones. So this is the distance from the star in astronomical units. An astronomical unit is the distance of the Earth from the Sun. Okay, one astronomical unit. So here is where the Earth is. One Earth mass at one astronomical unit. Okay, so the planets out there, we haven't found it. I mean, we, most of the programs that we would need would need to outlive the people that are working on them. You know, you need two or three generations, perhaps, to find planets out there. They're very difficult to find. But we, we have found planets here, okay? So we can start to make some general observations based on, on what we have already found out. So let's look at what we have found out, okay? Almost every star has one or more planets. Planets are the rule. They're not the exception. There are more planets out there than stars in the galaxy. We have found them around stars very close to us. We have found them around stars close to the galactic center, so they are everywhere. The most common type of, type of planet is called a mini Neptune. We don't have any of those in our own solar system. Okay, but they are the most common type of planets. This is, a, this is a planet with a mass between 5 and 10 Earth masses, okay, so they're bigger than the Earth, but not as big as Neptune. Okay. They sit somewhere between a nice giant like Neptune and a rocky planet like the Earth. It's not very clear where they have uh, what the surfaces might look like. The planets that we have found so remarkable diversity, okay? We have found planets bigger than Jupiter so at orbits closer than Mercury to the stars. They're so close to the stars that their, their atmospheres are boiling off, literally boiling off. We have found planets that orbit double star systems. There are two stars and the planets go around them. Like some of you have seen the movie Star Wars, I'm sure. It's like uh, the, the planet Tatooine. 
where you know, Luke Skywalker walks outside and he looks at a, at a double sunset. You have found planets around systems like that. Uh, there are others, other systems, that their uh, planets orbit in very eccentric orbits. Okay? They're not nicely circularized like our own, and some of them get ejected, thrown out of their systems after several million years. And finally, we have found about, last time I checked, must be around 100 planets in what we call the habitable zone. This is an interesting per term now, so I'll let, me, let me get into it. What does habitable zone mean? Water, liquid water. Now, you take a rocky planet with liquid water, water on its surface, and you place it next to a star. If you put it too close, all the water will evaporate. If you put it too far away, the water will turn to ice. It will be a frozen planet. So there is a certain range of distances from each star, different for each star, because not all of the stars are the same, where if you put a rocky planet with liquid water on its surface, the water will most likely be in liquid form. And this is what the habitable zone means. Okay, it's just the range of distances here from a star where a rocky planet with water on its surface would ensure that the, uh, the distance, the temperature would be enough, uh, good enough for the, for the water to stay in liquid form. Okay, so if the planet is in the habitable zone, when you hear, like in the news, that, ooh, astronomers have found a new planet in the habitable zone, okay, it doesn't mean that the planet is habitable, okay? It, it just means that if the planet has water, it would most probably be in liquid form. But this depends also on other factors, too, so we can't be entirely sure about that. Like the composition of the planet's atmosphere, okay, the atmospheric pressure, things like that. So why is liquid water so important? So biologists tells us, tells us like it's a universal solvent. All life on Earth requires it for its chemical reactions. We can't have life without liquid water. But what about life on other planets? Well, let's take a look at Proxima b. Uh, our team discovered this particular planet back in 2016. Uh, this is an artist's depiction of it. We don't have a picture of that planet, clearly. But uh, I quite like it. Um, so here's us. Here's where Proxima Centauri is. That's the closest star. Uh, last year, we found a planet around that star as well. So they seem to be quite common. Okay, that's about four light years away. So if you call somebody or Proxima Centauri, hey, four years. Oh, hey. Another four years. Okay. I ordered a pizza. Where's my pizza? Uh. So what's more, Proxima Centauri is most likely rocky. We are 95%, a little bit more than 95% confident that this is a rocky planet. And it sits nicely in the habitable zone of its own star. Proxima Centauri is much smaller than the sun. It's a, it's a, it's a red dwarf planet, uh, star. So if it turns out that Proxima Centauri has water, which we do not know, could it be habitable? This is a very difficult question to answer with a straight yes or no, because there are so many things that can influence habitability. For instance, we know that Proxima is a red dwarf star. It's much smaller and cooler than the sun, but it's also quite active. Every so often it flares. Okay, ejecting streams of highly energetic particles, X-rays, that would strip away the atmosphere of that planet. Okay, and it would make it very difficult for life to develop there, on the surface of the planet. What's more, the planet is so close to the star, it takes 11 days for it to go around the planet once. Its year is 11 days. Okay, and it is most likely tidally locked. What does that mean? This means like, when we look at the moon, we only see the, s the same side of the moon always. The moon is tidally locked to the Earth. Okay? It's the same, quite likely, with this planet. Okay? It's always the same side of the planet uh, looking at the star. What does that mean? This means that the heat of the star always boils or kind of falls on one side of the planet. So one side is really full of light and hot, and the other side is very cold. Okay, so that might make it very difficult for life to develop there as well. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So can we ever visit and find out if there is water and life there? 
So our fastest spacecrafts um, can reach speeds of about 100,000 kilometers per hour. So a hypothetical journey to Proxima B would take about 45,000 years. So that doesn't look too promising. But it might be possible to accelerate robotic microbes close to the speed of light and send them there to within about 20 years, okay, which is a possibility that project, uh, a privately funded project called Project Starshot is exploring. But do we really need to go all the way out there to other planets to find either there's life, water there, and so on? What if there's another way to check? And thankfully there is. And this takes us back to the spectral analysis. The next generation of very large telescopes that are being built will have powerful enough instruments to allow us to study the atmospheres of some of the closest exoplanets. Here you see a spectrum of the sun, and you can see here all the different chemical elements, the fingerprints of all the different chemical elements that make up the atmosphere of the sun. This is how we know what the sun is made of. Okay, so the different chemical elements making up the atmosphere of, of other stars and planets we leave their signatures in the spectrum of the light that reaches the Earth. Will we find signatures of water? Great, uh, but that alone is no guarantee of life. Water is quite abundant in the universe. Okay, so what if we detect water, oxygen, ozone, and methane together? These are what biologists call biosignature gases. Okay, if we find all of these gases together, there is a good chance there is some kind of biological activity going on on the surface of the planet. Why? Because methane and oxygen are very reactive. Okay, and if left to their own devices, oxygen would soon disappear from the atmosphere of the Earth. On the Earth, it is biological activity that keeps pumping in those gases into the atmosphere, maintaining a, an artificial chemical imbalance. Okay, so looking for signs of life on other planets involves looking for chemical disequilibria. And this is the direction the field is moving towards over the next few decades. So perhaps your children or grandchildren will know for sure or may even contribute to what is certain to be one of the greatest discoveries ever made in the history of mankind. A proper answer to whether we are alone in the universe. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that this also somehow links to ethos. So what is this link? Let's unpack it. It has to do with the way scientists practice their science. There are certain character traits that are important for doing good science. These are habits that begin to develop early in life. They do not develop in a vacuum. They need to be nurtured. They propagate through the stories we tell each other, our children, the lessons that we derive from them. So what is the role of stories in inspiring the next generation of scientists? I was a very curious child. I still am curious and a child in many ways. And I love to read. Alexander Dumas taught me the meaning of teamwork. Jules Verne told me there is joy to be found in exploring the unknown. Lewis Carroll, Jonathan Swift, Douglas Adams, they all taught me to never take myself too seriously or to hold on to any idea too tightly. And there are certain times that require you to be serious, but that most of the time it is more important to enjoy what you are doing and to just have fun. And from all the stories that never reach the spotlight, from all the important failures that are necessary, they're the necessary basis upon which we can build something that lasts, I'll learn to persevere. Thank you. <laughs>